Welcome to uh, this virtual event with a conversation with Sandra Brown and David Baldacci, uh, hosted by Watermark Books and Cafe in Wichita. We're delighted to be here. It's a wonderful day because it's the pub date for this beautiful book, Blind Tiger by Sandra Brown. But before we get onto the book and the authors, I want to just uh, go over a few housekeeping rules. We have a link to buy more books, which I'm sure you will want to do because signed books make wonderful holiday gifts. And you might as well start now with shopping for your holiday or for any occasion. I, I wanna just thank you all for uh, supporting local bookstores, supporting authors during this very strange year. And, and I hope that uh, you enjoy this conversation, you continue to support these authors and you continue to support Watermark Books and Cafe. We're open to the public with uh, um, shorter hours and we are open 24 seven online. And we're happy to connect with you in whatever way you wanna connect with us and however you wanna shop. One of the things about uh, Sandra Brown and David Baldacci is that they are wildly successful. Um, you know, um, Sandra Brown has sold upwards of 80 million copies um, worldwide and David Baldacci that many and more. But, and I just want you to think about those numbers because those are big and, and they're important and they're, they, they make for success but they also indicate an intimate connection really at the heart of what they do is an int intimate connection between the author and the reader with a story well told. And at the end of the day, that's what we are looking for. And that's what this success indicates. Um, it's just staggering. And I just think it's wonderful because it, it means that many people have, have read so something that I know I can't do with that in my life. Um, the other thing that these two authors have in common is that they share themselves generously with different causes that they believe in. And, um, you know, there's information on their web pages that you can go to to learn more about those things. And, 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 and I just think it's something to be celebrated. So I, wanna, I want to um, introduce to you um, San, uh, Sandra Brown. She has written professionally since 1981 and she has published over 80 novels, <laughs> 70, one of which have been New York Times, what? <laughs> New York <laughs> Times bestsellers. It was just yesterday. <laughs> And her work has been translated into 34 languages. And as I said, she sold millions and millions and millions of copies worldwide. She holds an honorary doctorate of human letters from Texas Christian University, where she and her husband, Michael Brown, have instituted the ELF, a scholarship awarded annually. She has served as president of the Mystery Writers of America and in 2008 named Thriller Master the top award given by the International Thriller Writers Association. Her other honors include the Texas Medal of Arts Award for Literature and Romance Writers of America's Lifetime Achievement Award. She has gone on two USO tours to Afghanistan and Cuba. Um, Blind Tiger is set during 1920. Um, take a look at that cover. I love it. It, it <laughs> indicates uh, somebody driving somewhere or away from something, which is where all stories sort of begin. Sometimes we think we're going to a new beginning that maybe turns out not quite what we think it's going to. And, or maybe we're getting away from something that we shouldn't have been involved in in the first place. But anyway, this book, which was published today, has been lauded by so many people and she's gotten um, two starred reviews in a couple of publications that all booksellers, librarians, readers, publishers read. 
And in book list, um, it, they said that prohibition, this is an excerpt, prohibition is the new law of the land, but murder, mayhem, lust, and greed are already institutions in the moonshine capital of Texas. Go figure. So if that doesn't <laughs> sell you, <laughs> you may guess that this book is set in 1920. This is from Publishers Weekly. The superior thriller from bestseller Brown firmly anchors all the action in the plot. However, Laurel and Thatcher are strong and inventive characters and their surprising decisions and evolving relationship keep readers engaged. Brown shows why she remains in the top rank of her field. That is so great and it's not a lie. And as you know, we have these Signed edition copies. Yeah. They're I wonderful. And look at that. My hand, I got writer's cramp signing uh, all those. Uh, <laughs> but you did. And they, I mean, it's just a, yeah, there, this is no, <laughs> no little, two little things at all. And also, I want to introduce David Baldacci, who is, is do you hear an echo? Is that just me? Okay. David Baldacci is a global number one best-selling author as well as one and one of the world's favorite storytellers. His books are published in over 45 languages and more than 80 countries. And as I said, millions and millions of copies sold. His works have been adapted for both feature film and television. He has a forthcoming book this fall. So keep uh, stay tuned. He's also, <laughs> the, as he has uh, many books, anyway, Gambling Man is what we put on our poster. So that's one that we'll go with. Uh, David is also the co-founder, along with his wife, of the Wish You Well Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting literary efforts, literacy efforts across America. And he's still a resident of his native Virginia. And David, I'm gonna turn it over to you and uh, let you take this virtual stage and um, we're gonna listen intently. Great. Well, thank Sarah. you, thank you so much. Thank you. Hey Sandra, it's great Hello. to see you. <laughs> Even on video, it's been a while. Um, we were talking before about the Amelia Island Book Festival. I did an event with Kathy Reichs about three weeks ago. She was at that event in February, Valentine's Day, as you, as you reminded me of 2020. And we got the festival in and had a great time. And then the world turned upside down. Absolutely did. Uh, that was the, my last public in life appearance. And I was so happy <laughs> to have shared it with you and Kathy and the other authors there, but little did we know that the sky was about to fall. Um, and I said earlier, it was like Mardi Gras, but we didn't know Lent was gonna last this long. <laughs> but it's turned out to be a blessing because uh, when, when I got back from Amelia Island, I went to my cubby hole in South Carolina where I go to write. And it was time to start a new book. I didn't know what I was going to write about. And then all, I got stuck for two months. I was in quarantine there by myself, away from my family. And uh, I started thinking, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to write about, but I know what I'm not going to write about. <laughs> I'm not going to write about COVID. I'm not going to write about all the other tumultuous events that were going on in our country at that time. So I thought, what was happening 100 years ago? And I went back to 1920 and I started looking and I went, hmm, prohibition went into effect on January 16th, 1920. That would be fun. And that's how Blind Tiger came about. Well, it, it's, a, it's a fabulous book. And as I was reading it, um, because I know him and you met him in Amelia, uh, Sheriff Bill Amos, 
Um, <laughs> tell, tell, yes. tell everybody about that, a character name that was auctioned off. Well, David, uh, David was gracious enough to invite me to be part of this Amelia Island uh, book festival, uh, an annual event. And I went down as a speaker, had a wonderful time. And that night, and this is also an annual thing where um, it's a fundraiser, they auction off different prizes um, and all the funds go to literacy programs on Amelia Island. And uh, am I not correct, David? That's, That's right. right. Yes. And so we were at this, you know, fancy dress uh, event and one of the auction items was to become a character name in a Sa the next Sandra Brown novel. So I thought this is going to be so embarrassing because somebody might bid $150. <laughs> and the bid got up to $25,000. And of course, I was so I was so humbled. Um, and so grateful, mostly because of the program that it represented. But the gentleman's name was Bill Amos, and he's a supporter of, you know, this whole endeavor that, that David is part of on Amelia Island. And, um, and I, was, I was just floored. Uh, so Bill Amos became the name of the very important pivotal role of the sheriff in Blind Tiger. So congratulations to Bill and mostly congratulations to the literacy program that, that you continue there. Well, I think Bill Amos more than got his money's worth because he's, <laughs> he's a fabulous character and he's throughout the book. And, you know, so I, I really enjoyed that. And, and that amount of money, um, was able to purchase a book for every school uh, school kid in Nassau County, Florida. Oh, that's wonderful! Wonderful uh, to know. Yeah, no, we we all appreciate that, and you were you were an enormous hit there, and it was just terrific. Um, so the book, um, you know, I love all your stuff. This one, you for me, um, you elevated everything. The prose. Is delicious. I mean, I just, I just devoured everything. Thank every, you. Sentence, every sentence was memorable. I went back and underlined a bunch and just read it off and, you know, read the dialogue off outline because it was so cool. Um, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about it. I, um, I've written some historical fiction, not as much as you have, but one thing that I found was that you almost get a little paranoid because, you know, you wrote about something that happened a hundred years ago. So every sentence you write, you're kind of like, do I need to check this <laughs> to make sure that, you know. That's what I said. <laughs> Do I need to check this? <laughs> and I had to. <laughs> That's why it took me so long to write it. <laughs> you, you do get a little paranoid about that because, you know, we're, you know, 21st century people, um, but we're dealing with time periods that were vastly different. I'll, I'll throw out one to you. When I was, I, I was working on a book that'll be out next year, but. And I just wrote a perfectly innocuous sentence and it just said something and, and tell me your experience with writing Blind Tiger, where there was an actress in Hollywood in 1953 and she's making some money. And so she decided to buy a bungalow off of Melrose Avenue. So I just wrote it in me, you know, she, she bought a house basically. And then I thought she's a single lady. So let me go check that. So in 1953, a single woman could not get a bank loan in the United States. <laughs> No, without a male co-signer. So the studios back then would actually hire guys to co-sign these loans. Um, so I had to go back and sort of explain that in different parts of the book. Um, so what, what were some of your experiences along those lines? Well, every, everything, um, you know, and I was, I was writing about 1920s Texas, which was different than 1920s like Chicago or New York even. So I, I had to look up who had indoor plumbing and who was still using outhouses. <laughs> and the, the town folk had plumbing, they had telephone lines, they had automobiles, some of them, but there were still people on horseback and out in the country, they had outhouses and they didn't have telephone lines and they were using coal oil or kerosene lamps instead of electricity. So, and, and the railroad, the very first scene um, when we, I introduced my hero, he's in a box car, he's freeloading uh, on the railroad 
and he jumps off. And um, I thought, now he's trying to get home. He's still hundreds of miles from home, which is also Texas geography that nobody gets because we're a big place. And so how could he still be hundreds of miles from home? But he is, and I thought, how far did the railroad go in 1920? So I actually had to seek out a railroad map of Texas in the year 1920 to see how far he could go on the railroad. So it was all of the, I would be writing something, go, wait, stop, have to look that up. And one thing, this is kind of a departure, but my heroine has a Model T. Now, I don't know how to drive a Model T. So I went and I thought, has to be kind of old, so she's in 1920. So I went back to 1915 Model Ts. They did not have electric starters. They didn't start making electric starters until 1916. <laughs> so she had to hand crank hers. And then at one point in the book, I said she floorboarded it. The accelerator was not on the floor. <laughs> it had three pedals. It had the clutch on the left in the middle, was reversed and on the right was the brake. And so I I was like, uh, where was the accelerator? The accelerator was on the steering wheel. So I couldn't say she floorboarded it because that wouldn't have worked. So it was things like that, that I had to fact check. And so that's a difference in writing what you and I typically write or contemporary and also allusions to, as you said, allusion to a woman buying property in 1953. Well, there were allusions, you, 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 we use um, allusions to, you know, airplanes or, or something that is so commonplace. And you go, wait a minute, you know, they didn't even know that at that point in time. And so even though a hundred years ago, in some ways seems very relatable because of all the societal shifts that were going on in that era as they are now. But in another way, you think of the, the things that have come along in the last 20 years, much less a hundred years. So it, it was different, but I have to say it was so much fun. It was really so much fun to write. Well, it, it really comes through. Uh, you can always tell if a writer is having a good time with a book, and you certainly were having a great time uh, with one oh. time. It was easy to see. Um, yeah, I also found out that um, Rolodexes did not exist in 1950. <laughs> they were called <laughs> thank, thank you very much. So the, the, the first chapter uh, of this book, I mean, the, the ending of it is amazing. It's a cliffhanger of all cliffhangers. It just kind of changes the entire direction of the story. So my question is, you have two, I mean, lots of great characters, but obviously two dominant characters in this book, uh, Laurel and Thatcher. Let's get into your process. I know, I know your fans want to, want to know this. Are you outline or are you organic or are you sort of in the middle? Where do you fall? I'm, I'm sort of in the middle, but more organic than outlining, because um, part of the fun for me is, and you've probably heard me say this when we've shared panels, but part of the fun for me of writing fiction is coming to work every day and waiting to see what's going to happen. Um, I think, and I speak for myself, but I think I speak for you too, you have to, you're your first reader you have to be entertained. If you're dozing off, I do, chances are your reader is going to be dozing off too. So you, you know in that scene, I've got to pump this up. Something's got to happen. Now, when I introduced this idea to my publisher I, and my editor, I said, okay, so... I'm thinking about going back to 1920. What was happening? And guess what? It wasn't so much different from 2020, which was when I was in quarantine writing this. It was like we had all of the societal issues that we have now. We had an unpopular war 
World War I. It's very unpopular. Hundreds of thousands of people died. And they were getting Spanish flu, which is a global endemic. Why, why, why is this sounding familiar? The women's movement finally resulted in suffrage. So we had the Me Too movement. So I was like, things weren't all that different. But as if things weren't bad enough, you couldn't buy a drink <laughs> because prohibition went into effect in January 16th of that year. So I said, I'm, uh, I'm thinking about doing this historical. And what if I had a soldier coming back who was suffering from post-traumatic stress, but nobody knew it by that name. It's called shell shock. And what if I had a woman who was suddenly left destitute and she had to create her own destiny? She had to seize control of her own life. She refuses. She resolves never to be dependent on anyone else again for her livelihood, for her choices. This would have been a big deal in 1920, ex especially in rural Texas. And so I put those two characters in place. I kind of knew where it was gonna go. I knew about the moon shining. I knew about the town that I was going to pattern Foley after uh, because it was the moonshine capital of Texas. So I thought, set it there where there's murder, mayhem, all the things that they use in the, in the tag. Um, but in terms of where it was going to go, no idea. I just opened it up. I didn't know that when the sheriff came along, I thought that'd be a great name for Bill Amos. Uh, I didn't know about the bootlegger. I didn't know about Gert, or I didn't know about the prostitute, Corinne. And even when I mentioned her getting beat up, she was just the prostitute that had gotten beat up. She didn't even become a character until she showed up on the pages. And so that's what's fun for me is when a character walks into a scene and I go, who, who are you? And then I get to take it you know, from there. So I do write from a, a very kind of organic, more than sitting down and do a scene by scene, chapter by chapter outline. Because I think once I would have done that, I would have told the story. And I always feel like the story is there. I've just been granted the opportunity of excavating it, it or of it's it's a parallel universe and I just get to watch it unfold that's the way I feel about it I never feel like I create anything well it's um you know I I'm I'm exactly like that too right I've always felt like I've tried outlines from time to time and it turns out that nothing in the outline ends up in the novel because it doesn't seem to work and I think <laughs> Unless you're in the moment and you're having to make all these decisions and characters walk in and out, and some get important, some less important, and the stories take twists and turns, it's almost like you can. There are two ways to learn how to drive a Formula One car. You can read a book about it, outline, or you can drive a Formula One car and see what right. happens. <laughs> right. It seems like when you're you have that pressure to make the decisions about where the story's going and you're so immersed in it, it becomes. It's not telling stories; it's like living it. Living it, it is. It's I. Uh, I kind of sit back and and uh, it, it's because it, I had a lot of drama study when I was in school and did a lot of you know plays and things. But I always think of things in a proscenium arch, <laughs> and my characters are on stage, and if they do something or say something, I write it down. But I kind of envision it as though I'm, I'm watching it unfold. And, and I just, I write it down. Now, sometimes they get, maybe yours don't do this, mine do. Uh, sometimes they get very stubborn and they just stand there and fold their arms and look at me and like, what, what are we doing? And I'm like, oh, do something, say something. But I have to tell you on this particular book, 
it was getting longer and longer and longer. And I called um, my editor and I said, you know, this book is becoming the longest book I've ever written. And I said, but my characters keep thinking of stuff to do. <laughs> and I feel like I have to write it down. And he just laughed and he said, go with it. You know, let me worry about how long it is. You know, we'll, from a publishing standpoint, we'll figure that out. But it, it is your characters, if, if they become as human as they're supposed to, to the reader, then they're taking over the story. I feel like they're, which makes us both sound like we're a little crazy and schizophrenic. <laughs> and I think all fiction writers are. We live in a world of make-believe half of our lives. <laughs> we absolutely do. And look, I know it's, it's a longer book than you usually do, but I have to say the pace never flags. It never oh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And something interesting is always popping up on every page, whether it's, you know, a piece of dialogue and, um, you know, there was one line in this where someone, a character said, you know, um, you're really, you would, with a gun, you're really, would be really hard to miss. You know, I couldn't miss you with both eyes closed. And that was like, <laughs> not only was it a funny line, but it spoke a lot about the character who was saying it too. So it was just, you know, there's a million of those lines in this book and it was just great stuff. So I have to ask you this. I, I, there's a, there was a rumor that for research for this novel, did you actually go out and build a still? Oh, that's a rumor. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Michael and I got out in the backyard. <laughs> no, that is not true. <laughs> I wish I could say, oh yeah, <laughs> but no, no, no. Um, I watched a lot of videos. There are contemporary stills, and people do make, you know corn mash liquor in these in these stills. I think I just rather drive to my local liquor store. <laughs> it looked like a lot of work to me. I mean, I have trouble boiling an egg. So I can't imagine having to, you know, cook this mash. Um, but it was fascinating. And and the fact that this goes back centuries. I mean, you know, centuries people have been making corn liquor. Um, the, you know, the, the bourbon that we drink um, is, is aged in casks that are smoked, and that's where it gets the color. But when it comes out of the worm, which is the coil <laughs> in the barrel, comes out the spigot, it's clear. That's why they call it white lightning. And it, it's not aged. It's very raw. Uh, and so, you know, I'm not advocating that everybody go out and, <laughs> and make their moonshine. <laughs> but no, I didn't build a still. <laughs> I just studied how they were built. <laughs> you can find anything on YouTube these days. It's just absolutely amazing. Uh, right. right. I, 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 was, I worked in a film one time, it was in a rural area where they did a lot of moonshine as well. And some of the people, some of the extras in the film brought some moonshine as gifts to, you know, people on the film. And um, I've seen moonshine before. And I, this was funky moonshine. It was fruit moonshine. So they give you these mason jars. And it's like these big blackberries are floating in the middle of this moonshine. And I was, you know, I was raised to respect everybody. So I was like, thank you so much. This is just terrific. Thank you very much. Have a good day. <laughs> I was like, I'm not drinking that. Coward, I, coward. <laughs> I might not be here to interview today if I had that moonshine. I, I didn't know what that was about. So, well, you know, and and, and in the book, Ernie, our my main moonshiner, you know, he says we we don't make any pop skull, and uh, we and he said if you kill or blind somebody, your business is dead for. <laughs> so, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be responsible for blinding or killing anybody. 
Uh, that's what passed for regulation back then, I guess. <laughs> you, know, you don't want to blind or kill anybody. And, right. You know, there go. So you have two, you know, very tragic characters, Laurel and Thatcher, um, who are, you know, dissimilar, but also similar in many ways. They're both, you know, they've been damaged. They're trying to, they're trying to find something. They're both trying to survive, really. They're just trying to, to keep going and they've got, they've lost a lot and um, they just want to have a life. And and I loved how you intertwined the stories back and forth between the chapters until they sort of came together and met and then things started to really pop off. And, and for, for your legion of fans who also love your romances, this has got that covered. Don't worry about that. It's a thriller. Scandra <laughs> uh, Brown hits a home run on that. You won't be disappointed at all. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, so when you, when you were conceiving these characters, which did you think of first? What, was, it, was it Laurel? Was it Thatcher? Was it sort of simultaneously? Did one build off the other? Actually, I've, I've thought about, and, and I often, you know, most usually, in fact, write uh, from the male point of view, and it's kind of <laughs> an anomaly, but I, I, I do, and um, I think it's because I see that character more, maybe because I'm the female looking out, and so I see that character more. Um, so I thought of Thatcher, but when I put Laurel in her situation, and the more I got into the story, and then again, another note to my editor, I said, I started out, this was going to be Thatcher's story, but it really turns out to be Laurel's story. Thatcher doesn't have the arc that she does. He kind of ends the same way he is when we meet him. He's a man of... of morals he's strong silent um I, I thought of a young gary cooper yep. you know most people don't even probably remember him but the stoic cowboy kind of had a code of morality and if he was called upon to do something it was might be the wrong thing but for the right reason it had a it was a code and, and he kind of is that character throughout the book. He doesn't ever really compromise much, but you also don't want to mess with him because if you do, then you're going to be in trouble. Laurel is the one who had the arc. Laurel is the one who starts out, um, you know, the kind of the humble wife going along with everything. Then she has dual tragedies back to back, she suddenly finds herself in this situation where she has, has to seize control of her life. The challenge for me, David, was to, and this, this worried me, was to make her a strong woman who was gonna be fiercely independent, reliant only on herself, and yet make her likable and make her feminine and make her vulnerable. And so I used her relationship with her father-in-law, whom she had never met until the first chapter of the book, showing her softness toward him, showing her softness toward the prostitute, you know, the soiled dove, kind of taking her in. So I demonstrated her soft side, her vulnerability, even when she was putting up a very brittle, um, self-protective guard. And I wanted her to be likable and relatable. And, and I think a lot of women in 2021 are that way. They have to be strong in their independence and in the decisions they make and in the way they govern their lives. But at heart, they're still soft. They still respond in a feminine way. And I, I don't think that that's too much of a, too, too much to add. I don't see that they're mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know? And there's always, there's always been sort of a double standard there anyway, you know? And I'm, it's easier for the guys, certainly. You know. <laughs> yeah, well, but, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. You said that. I, said, I, said, I, I, will, I, will, I will cheerfully admit 
we are the week for sex. Okay. <laughs> it's <gotta be> close. <laughs> But, uh, hey, I've met Michelle. She's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> <laughs> she is, and she, you know, she's, I'm, I married well above my pay grade, that's for sure. So, <laughs> um, you also um, write about um, a lot of corruption in a small town, you know, yeah. with politicians, law enforcement, and all that, and you, and you do it extremely well and, and very plausible and believable. So, talk to me about that. Well, it was, that was kind of founded on my research because, um, and of course it's, it's no surprise to me, Texas had share. <laughs> of uh, but that's, it was so interesting when I started doing the research, I came across this book that was published by History Press in Charleston, South Carolina, and it was called The Glen Rose Moonshine Raid. Now, when I saw that, while I was researching, I went, Glen Rose is 50 miles down the road from where I've lived all my life. And I know Glen Rose, it's a quaint little town. And um, I had no idea. It was the moonshine capital of Texas. And I went, what? <laughs> so I ordered the book, read the book. It's written by a man named Martin Brown, who was a detective in, the, in Dallas forever. And he retired to Glen Rose, learned this story and wrote this book. So I contacted him and I said, I, I, I never knew this. And I've lived here all my life and come to find out it was the moonshine capital of Texas. And there was a big raid organized by the Texas Rangers and local law enforcement in 1923 so it was that's the town that and the situation that i kind of patterned foley after but um all across the country when prohibition went into effect the goal was to solve all the society problems that were going on at the time the alcoholism of all the men who came back from world war one well, they began drinking because women had taken their place in the workforce, so they were jobless. They were dealing with post-traumatic stress. They couldn't feed their families, support their families, much less themselves. So they became really the first homeless in America. And so all of these issues were blamed on, well, it's the alcohol. <laughs> It was only putting a Band-Aid on the larger issues. And so it created the first huge, enormous crime wave and organized crime that we're still living with. So all it really did was just make law-abiding citizens outlaws. Therefore, it, and, and because of men will get a drink, women will get a drink if they want it. So it was right for corruption. You know, if you're a law enforcement officer, but you want your whiskey at the end of the day, then you're not going to go out and shut down a moonshiner who is making you whiskey. So that's where a lot of the corruption came in. But and it wasn't just, you know, local. I mean, it was nationwide. It was everywhere. It became overnight moonshining and bootlegging became boom industries because yeah. of the Volstead Act. Right. I mean, but for prohibition, there would have been no Al Capone. You know, there, and, and I guess for, and for a lot of areas, particularly in rural Texas, you know, that was employing people, that was paying people to do jobs. And that's where the money was. And also in Texas, especially uh, the bull weevil had in 18, 19, and 20, had ruined the cotton crop. So cotton crop um, farmers were looking for another crop. So they started growing corn, creating a glut in that market. They couldn't, you know, it, it was, it, there was too, so who did they sell their corn to? 
moonshiners. <laughs> so all of these, you know, cotton farmers that became corn growers then started selling their their corn to the moonshiner. It was a, you know, it was an economic necessity mm -hmm. almost to keep food on the table. Right. Yeah. So it was a conspiracy of the bull weevil and Congress. <laughs> right. <laughs> Now you um, you mentioned that you went to Charleston where you where you like to write. We've talked about this before, and so with the pandemic, actually Hilton Head, actually Hilton Head. Oh, Hilton. okay, Hilton Head, South Carolina. But so um, how you know writing wise, how how has the pandemic affected you? You know what's what's changed for you? You know, except for that first two months after I left Amelia Island. Uh, the day after Valentine's Day, I went to our place in Hilton Head and I was doing, you know, uh, promotion stuff and everything for Thick as Thieves, which was the previous book. And I finished and here I was, I couldn't get home. Uh, airlines were shut down. I didn't want to drive because it was longer than one day's drive. And uh, so I was there by myself and I thought, what am I going to write about? So I think the isolation in a way was, uh, was good for writers. I also think it was good for readers because there's only so much binge TV that you can do. And so I think people who hadn't read in a long time, even members of my own family have claimed, you know, I'd kind of gotten off reading because there was so much good stuff to watch on TV, but now they're back to reading and they're reading with a frenzy. And so I think our industry in a way has really benefited from people seeking entertainment and finding the joy in books. I mean, I know you, I, I cannot be without a book. And in case I don't have one, I've got spares. <laughs> you know, that if I finish one, I know that I've got a backup plan here. Um, so I think in a way, it has it is been good for, for reading and, and getting people back to finding how much entertainment can be found in their own imagination, you know? Just... Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I, you know, I always have sort of envisioned this guy laying on his couch with his remote and watching television <laughs> and up on the screen, it comes and it says, you have reached the end of the Netflix content. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh. There's nothing left. There's nothing left. A but, meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, you know, book reading is really the only, you know, sort of entertainment um, that, allows you to participate in sort of finishing off the book and the story. The characters are what you think they look like and or speak like. And you can imagine the entire town. We say it in words, but they visualize it. You know, when you go to a movie, you watch television, it's all right there. It's not like you add anything to it, but I, you certainly do. And I just think it's, I've always loved that since I was a little kid. I know you have as well. Um, I think, I think we're being readers is probably one of the big reasons you're writers today because just that fascination of putting these stories together and enthralling people and being enthralled as a reader you know you well know. it's so it's so it has to be interactive you know in and every book that i read it's like a letter especially for me from the writer it's like you know i this is a gift to me from the writer and um and I, and I, I think, you know, I know you get fan letters too. That, so you just don't know how much that book touched me, how many times I've read it, how it connected it, it resonated with me in a very deeply personal way. That's hard to do with a screen where, as you say, everything is already there. It doesn't, it doesn't require anything from you. And a reader, it requires that personal connection. And um, if, if I entertain my reader, uh, I can sleep at night. I've done my job because that's all I've ever set out to do. Because when I open a book, I hope it's the best book I've ever read. You know, I want it to be good. 
And I think when a reader opens a David Baldacci or Sandra Brown or whomever, they're wanting the best book they've ever read. They want it to take them away. They want to be transported into that world for a short period of time. Right. I know we both get asked the question a lot, you know, how do you do what you do? And um, I think you and I, we could make, sort of mechanically tell people, you know, we do this, this is our kind of a process and this is a typical day and all that stuff. But, you know, what I really want to tell them is, you know, I sit down and I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I just sit <laughs> and, you know, if it comes to me, I write it down. You kind of do, David. <laughs> you kind of do it. <laughs> But it still, it feels, you know, it feels like kind of a little bit of the seat of the pants, which is not a bad thing, because I, I think if you, I've always thought any writer who's just, they finally figured out, you know, exactly how to write every book, some of the fun goes away, you know, that little bit of fear of like, oh my God, can I do this again? I think you need that to keep your edge. I think the fear factor is the best gift that a writer can get, because I think the anathema is reading your own press releases and getting comfortable. Um, and when I come to this keyboard every day, I'm scared half to death because it's like whatever. And I, I don't even like the word talent. Um, there's a weight to that word that, that bothers me. You know, uh, um, if someone says your gift or your talent, um, I think of it, it's so lofty sounding because I work <laughs> at it. And if it were easy, everybody would do it because it's a great life. You get to live most of your life make-believing. And um, so it, it's, it's hard work. Um, and I'm scared to death every day that whatever talent I had left in the middle of the night the bad fairies came and stole it away or i'm the world's greatest imposter and the first 82 books have been a fluke and an accident you know of nature and and blind tiger is going to be the one that exposes me as the biggest fraud ever and so but i think in that that way is what you said um I think that fear is healthy. I think if you ever feel like, oh, I've made it, you know, I've gotten here, then you're sunk. <laughs> I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, I, I kind of, I, I, same as you, I approach every day that sort of same way, you know, that you're going you're gonna to be found out and, you know, everything that's come before, it's a fluke. It was like, a, you've been the luckiest person in the world. And, but I think too, you know, we also, you know, it may not be talent, but I think we both like to sweat. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sit down and write this stuff and like the blood oozes it's, down. It's, your it's, it's a total masochistic <laughs> career. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And, but I think, you know, anybody, you know, just watch this series on Hemingway, uh, Kim Burns series on Hemingway was wow. amazing. And it was almost comforting in the fact that, you know, he was miserable <laughs> most of the time. But it's, uh, um, I, I, I really am kind of grateful for the paranoia that I live with because I think it makes me constantly want to be better. I never want it to be said, um, well, she phoned that one in, you know? Uh, I want the reader to appreciate, and, and all the research in Blind Tiger, I hope is invisible, because that's the best kind of research. I never want to try to show somebody how smart I am. Look how much research I did. It should blend into the story in such a way that it's invisible, and it doesn't take the reader out of the story, because it is all about the story. It's right. all about the story. Well, I can, I can say for a fact, there are no flip pages in this book. And I call writers who've done a lot of research and they want to get it all in there and they don't want to take the time to integrate it. They just find a place and they smack it in and the reader's reading and they run into all this crap and they flip, 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 flip past right, it. Right, right, right. There's, none of, there's none of that in here, Sandra. I mean, it's, it's seamless. It's all, 
it, in fact, the research for me truly was invisible because it just was a total component of the story. You know, either somebody said it or there was a sentence here that gave me some information I yeah. needed, but it, it was it was very natural. I so, needed to know it. I needed to know it, but the reader doesn't need to know how long it took to find out all that stuff. <laughs> you're right, they don't. I mean, I want them to appreciate it because I want them to do that hell of a lot of work that went into this book. But you're absolutely right. It, they shouldn't under, and with research for a novelist, it's like do all the research and then leave 99% of it out, you know? Right. Like, Right. Back when we need. So I'll ask you one more question, and then we're going to, I know that you have some people who want to ask questions. So, so what's next for you? Uh, <laughs> are you sure you weren't paid by Grand Central Publishing to ask me that? <laughs> are you taking bribes? I, I haven't talked to Ben Severe in like an hour. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> is tuned in. <laughs> uh, no, I, um, I, I'm, I'm going to, Keep it kind of close to my best. I I don't know. Uh, there are several things on the table, and yeah, you know, we'll see. I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed writing the historical. I thought that I was ready for kind of a departure from the inundation of bad news that we have to swim up, try to keep our heads above water every day. Um, and so this was, it was kind of a fun departure for me. So I don't know, there may be another historical, I don't know, but it will be hopefully suspenseful, have the Sandra Brown trademarks of a few surprises, the love story, but it will still be, you know, it's like, it would be like a David Baldacci. When that your reader picks up that book, I know what to expect because you're excellent at telling a story. And so I don't care if a story is set on a wagon train or a spaceship, as long as you engage me in the story. That's what it's about. So we'll see. All right. Well, speak, speaking as a fan, I hope you go back to historical thrillers because I, I really love this book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, the first question is actually my question. And would you talk about the title? I know it's got, oh, it, it, you know, I mean. Of course, I didn't ask that question. But, well, well, you know, you let me. <laughs> well, uh, it, during my research, Sarah, I came across that term. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what, what, what is that? And I, of course, found out it was another word for a speakeasy <laughs> or some um, business front that fronts as a speakeasy, you know, in the back. And I, I researched it. It actually was not an American origin. It was 1850s England, businesses that fronted for a business that made illegal whiskey or whatever, gin, whatever, was called a blind tiger. And I thought that is, that's a, it would look great on a book cover. <laughs> and it does. I liked the alliteration. I liked that it was five words. And I thought it would be more intriguing. It would, you know, grab people. And uh, I love the font that they used. Oh, um, it's beautiful. For the cover. It, it just fits so well. So blind yeah, is really... another word for speakies. And actually, we're talking about Charleston. But there is a speakeasy, a bar and grill in Charleston, South Carolina, that has been there for a long time, and it's still called Blind Tiger. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, so there are a couple questions here. Let me find this one. Um, do you ever imagine, um, uh, David, you've worked in movies and you uh, you know, I know you never watch Netflix or anything, but um, you must be aware of, uh, you know, have a lot of actors in your head or, or do you ever have somebody in mind when you're. Are you asking? Yes. Do you visualize somebody or David, do you visualize, you know, some, Sandra Bullock or anybody, you know, um, Matthew me. McConaughey say or. Uh, for me and, and, and Sandra can answer, I, no, because I know the odds are impossibly long that any this will ever be made into a film. 
-hmm. then, then I feel like that I'm writing a screenplay on disguise and it's turned out to be a really crappy novel. Okay, so yeah, I, I totally sense. agree. Uh, I get this question a lot, Sarah. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's odd, but, but people will say, well, who did you see playing it in the movie when you wrote it? And I've had four television movies made. Uh -huh. Not once did I cast my book with an yeah. actor because my characters walk into the scene and I see them as them. I never, mm -hmm. you know, transpose somebody's face onto their, the, the, the way that I see them. And mm -hmm. um, so I, I agree with David. It's like you're writing a screenplay in disguise if you do that. And mm -hmm. then people come along and they say, well, now the, the book is, who would you want to play? And I have to go, hmm, let me think about it. Because the characters are so real to me that if they walked in the door, I would recognize them as them. But right. they wouldn't look like anybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. makes sense. Is there anything that surprises you after, after so, having written so many books when you sit down to write like wow I've never thought of that or a challenge that you've had or or do, does it does everything start new or can you do you follow what I'm I guess are you surprised by anything I'm surprised that um <laughs> I'm surprised every single day that I come to the keyboard that I get to do this for a living mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've been enormously blessed with a family who supported me, with colleagues like David who have supported me that I've become friends with over the years, that I've worked with amazing editors in this business, that I have booksellers that tout my books, that I get fan mail from all over the world in various languages that I have to translate to find out what they're saying. And to me, who grew, who was born in Lorena, Texas, that's a long way to come. And so I, I just, I count my blessings every day. I pinch myself every day that I, I get to do this for a living. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm so grateful, you know, for that opportunity because I love storytelling. Right, right. Have you ever thought about, I just, you were talking about earlier about the intimacy of a book with a reader and how you get letters. And I was wondering if you've ever thought about writing a novel in that the form of letters the would there time, ever be a thing you consider well i remember reading a book a long time ago that was just written in the letters and also the uh, was it the josephine books uh, it was about josephine and bonaparte and it was a trilogy uh -huh. uh, and uh it's sandra gullen i think is the author's name forgive me if i'm wrong but um they were wonderful and they were told the whole three books in the trilogy were told in letters and it was it was wonderful that might be a challenge because with each book you ask, ask me if i you know do something different or what technique or whatever and actually with each book i try to build in something i've never done before because i think challenging myself and david you're shaking your head you can relate to this but i think challenging yourself uh, to do something different, try something different because it keeps me on my toes. Can I get away with this? You know, can I, how long can I do this? Can I pull this off? And, um, and so with each book, I kind of build in something that I have not done before. Um, and, and it's subtle. It, I'm the only one that knows it. Um, but I, I try to do that with each, with each book, just to, you know, keep my <laughs> skills as sharp as they can possibly be. Well, it's working. <laughs> it's working very, very well. Um, is there anything else either of you would just like to add before we wrap up? Well, I, I look forward to seeing Sandra in person soon <laughs> yeah i hope we have an occasion coming up uh soon but um i think david and i 
have shared many panels and have gotten to be friends over the years. And, um, and I'm grateful for that. Um, he's not only an excellent writer, he's a wonderful human being, and he was so gracious to do this uh, tonight. And so thank you. Um, but um, I think we're all ready, even though these events reach a lot of people and they're wonderful. I think I told you ahead of time, I miss coming to, to Watermark. And I remember my first time there and this, you know, auditorium with people in it and seeing the reactions of your readers because we were a, a long time as it is to get applause. You know, a stage performer gets their applause. Exactly, you're right. You get to take a curtain call, you get to take a bow. And well, we're a year away from writing the book when we actually get to see the reader's reaction to it. So I miss that one-on-one -on -one meeting the readers and hearing what they have to say. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, I, I just really wanna thank you both for taking the time to spend with us this evening. It's been a pleasure. You know, your books make my job so much fun because I get to live a little bit vicarious and I do get to talk about your books. <laughs> often and and it it really is just remarkable and as i said it's the book and the reader and there isn't a more intimate experience that i can think of as someone who reads so i i thank you so much and thank you for the signed copies we will we we still have these available share with your friends and and um i wish you all a wonderful evening and thank you to Grand Central for putting this together. Really appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you, Sarah. You. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. Uh -huh. Bye.